Welcome to Power Up, the uptime podcast focused on the new hot off the press technology that can change the world. Follow along with me, Alan Hall, and Itasaur's Phil Totaro as we discuss the weird, the wild, and the game-changing ideas that will charge your energy future. All right, our first idea is from our friends at Vestas, and it is a, uh, a relatively sophisticated system for handling wind turbine blades during maintenance, um, particularly offshore. And if you think about how you try to manipulate a blade offshore to do repair work on it, it's not, it's not easy to do that on the deck of a ship. So the, the concept is you take a crane, get the blade off the turbine, you move it down into the deck of the ship, and it sits in these cradles. And they move it the, from the support cradles to a, a third device, which allows the blade to rotate. And they can slide it into a shelter that's built up on deck so you can actually repair the blade without getting wet <laughs> or, or too hot or too cold, probably probably too cold in most cases, uh, which is a, a, a really difficult task to do. And Vestas, Phil, has, has come up with a really unique idea on how to manage this. Yeah, this this one is very interesting because we have comparable systems to this onshore, but it's obviously a lot harder to implement offshore. So for instance, having the tent, it's going to sound like the stupidest thing ever, just like having a tent around the blade to be able to, to you know, protect the, the area that you're scarfing out or whatever, if you're doing that kind of a repair, um, you know, that's, that's important. That's an important consideration. And while it's obviously possible to do that today offshore, um, the fact that you would have to use the crane to you know, place and pick or use the um, uh, the fixtures that are attached to the crane to rotate the blade and then lower it into the cradle, that can be complicated and time-consuming and expensive to, to do with the the onboard crane on, on the vessel. So the fact that you can lower it into this rotating, we'll call it a rotating cradle uh, or fixture, um, and the fact that, you know, they've, they've got this uh, capability to be able to put up the, the you know, tarp or tent um, to be able to protect the blade to, to do the repairs, it's, it's really helpful and, and gives you um, potentially improved quality uh, in, in the repairs, uh, pretty much at the same level that you would get from doing it onshore. Yeah, I like the idea here that we're basically taking a concept that we know, we, if you've seen major blade repairs on the ground, a lot of times a temporary tent is put up so that you can work in the wind, rain, snow, cold, whatever it may be. Doing the same thing here offshore. Important for operations and maintenance for the future as we have to start doing some you know larger and larger repairs to these blades. But a big important part of this is if anybody that's been involved in lifting operations, you want to minimize the amount of times that you actually touch these blades. When you talk about uh, installing them offshore, you build them in the factory, you move them from the factory to the yard, then you move them from the yard to maybe quayside if the factory is close to the, to the water. Then it goes from quayside, another crane puts it on the boat, and then it, the vessel might, might be a barge, and then the barge goes out to the working rig, and then they have to pick it up. And every time you pick a blade with a crane or slings or uh, other kind of fixtures, you have a risk for damaging it. So being able to drop it on deck and move it and manipulate it however you need to to do repairs without having to repick, 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 especially in a marine environment, is is super important. So I like this idea. I think it'll you'll see it in the future, but in specialized cases. Yeah, it, it's a great idea. Our our next is up from Siemens Gamesa. And this one has to do with what they call ride through, right? So the equipment on a wind turbine has to handle the grid voltage fluctuations. In order to do that, a lot of the equipment that is on a wind turbine has to be over-designed, have special capabilities to handle uh, grid voltage fluctuations. And that leads to additional cost and complexity into the equipment. Well, the Siemens idea is to take a transformer, a ver basically a variable transformer, an auxiliary transformer, and have a quote-unquote electronic tap and a a transformer converts uh, electricity from one form into another. Simply said, it can raise or lower the voltage. Uh, same thing with current. So they're using semiconductors. So if you've got a primary and a secondary and a transformer, you can adjust the amount of turns um, in a primary or a secondary using semiconductors as a switch. So in a voltage fluctuation case, all the auxiliary equipment in the turbine uh, won't see it. 
because this auxiliary transformer with these semiconductors are going to stabilize the voltage within two AC cycles, which is really quick. And that allows you to use much simpler, lower cost equipment in the turbine. Phil, this idea makes infinite sense to me, depending on what the cost is for this auxiliary transformer with all these semiconductor switches, it could be a lot less expensive. Yeah, and and I think the the impetus behind this was for larger onshore turbines, um, particularly in markets where you've got um, a need to provide well a, a lot of fluctuation um, in in grid voltage and frequency, but also where you may have to be able to provide ancillary services quickly. Um, and so this technology will come in really handy with that. And I, I, you know, it's funny because every week these these patents publish and and we're reading them at Intel Store to to extract whatever technology intelligence we can get out of them or, um, you know, just catalog the the you know sixty thousand plus patents that I think we've cataloged over the last fourteen years now. Um, there are ones like this that actually stand out a little bit because it it's not the most revolutionary patent uh, or technology in the world but it's something that's actually going to potentially impact um cost and improve function of a wind turbine and so we we like ideas like this and and we want to see more ideas like this alan and i talked with uh r&d test systems regularly and they have shared with us some of the testing mechanisms that they have to basically in, introduce grid problems backwards into turbines, into generators, into control systems, and all this to make sure that they work. So this is a system that will that gets you that certification, that gets you to that level, then it can handle that, but in, like, like Phil said, a more cost-effective way. And one of the things I want to focus on here is the speed of which it happens. So when it talks about two AC cycles... Okay, if we're in the United States, usually an AC, you're cycling at, or your power's at 60 hertz. So that means two of those 60 hertz. So in one thirtieth of a second, this thing can find the issue or correct that issue. Or if you're in the European Union and it's, you're at 50 hertz, then it's in one twenty-fifth of a second. That's how fast these things will operate to make sure that that grid interruption, that grid voltage problem or current problem doesn't make it back up into the turbine to actually damage something. So pretty impressive there and doing it in a which a way that saves costs. That's the kind of stuff that we need within the wind industry to, to make us more competitive or to make it more competitive versus other forms of energy generation. Our last fun idea or our last idea of, of the week is a fun idea regarding Halloween in a Halloween candy container. And if you've just had the kids arrive to your house, usually they have some sort of bag or a bucket that they want you to throw some candy into. Well, this is a novel idea because this is sort of a hands-free containment device that is worn on the child's back. So it's like a, a, a clear backpack. But on top of that, there's a chute that comes from the backpack forward with like a little character with an open end, like a, a, I don't know, a monkey with his mouth open or an elephant with his mouth open. So you actually throw the, the candy into this little animal mouth and it deposits back in the backpack. So the kid has, is hands-free. Uh, I, I don't know why the kid would have to be hands-free to do this, but the concept is, well, they're carrying a flashlight. They may be holding someone else's hand. It's a safety feature device. Uh, and Phil, it, it's also fun for the people uh, that get to throw candy at this kid and try to hit the target, I'd assume. <laughs> well, hopefully they're not just chuck chucking it at them but i don't think that's almost the size it's all those little tiny ones not those big full candy bars that you give out phil are you a full-size candy bar household phil yes absolutely if if we're doing it we're not we're not miniature anything i mean i i'm not from texas but every everything is bigger there and and as it should be i think this thing would work perfect for i like the idea for berry picking I do that whenever I'm home up in Wisconsin in the summertime. I'm bit raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, and if I had this backpack on, you just boop, boop. Then it would keep me from eating them the whole time out of a bucket. <laughs> 